Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I'm so glad to be with you. And today is video number one in response to Kenneth Gentry, uh, who recently uh, began a series, he's now posted four, of articles in responding to my book, my new book, uh, in, entitled Watching for the Parousia, Were Jesus' Apostles Confused? Now, uh, I knew when I wrote that book, I knew that it struck at the very foundation of futurist eschatology, and I mean all millennial and post millennial. And here's why absolutely foundational to the eschatology of all millennialism and post millennialism is the idea that in Matthew chapter 24, as Jesus and his apostles were leaving the temple, where Jesus had just predicted, Matthew 23, 37 and following, the coming destruction of the city and the temple, the apostles begin to sh uh, show Jesus the beauty, the size, the glory of the stones of the temple and all of the surrounding uh, uh, buildings. And Jesus responded, Matthew 24 and verse 2, Do you not see these things? For the time is coming in which not one stone shall be left standing on top of another. And the apostles were, were shocked. And they immediately responded, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming, your, the Greek word parousia, and of the end of the age? Well, you see, about 99%, not quite that much, <laughs> but the majority of commentators, they come to these verses and they say, oh my goodness, the apostles were so confused that they could not imagine the destruction of that temple unless it occurred at the end of time. John Calvin said that it was impossible for the apostles to imagine the destruction of that magnificent temple unless it occurred at the end of time. Well, John Calvin was wrong. Uh, but modern commentators, commentators through the centuries, have and do make the same identical assumption. Now, ask yourself the question, what, a couple of issues here, why would the apostles think about the end of time and the end of the Christian age when Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple? Folks, that temple did not represent the Christian age. What age did it represent? Oh, the law of Moses and God's covenant relationship with Israel. It did not represent the Christian, i.e. the current age. Now ask yourself this following question. Upon what basis would the apostles automatically think of the so-called imaginary end of time when Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple when they knew not only did they know, but in the Jewish uh, culture, they had four feast days commemorating the fall of Jerusalem and the temple that occurred in B.C. 586. Now, in 586 B.C., Jeremiah, Zephaniah, and, uh, and the other prophets, Ezekiel included, described that coming destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by calling it the day of the Lord. It would be the time of the presence from the Greek word, you know, the, the Septuagint, Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. It would be the time of the presence, Greek word prosopon, meaning face. It would be the time of the presence of the Lord. It would be the time of the Lord's coming in judgment of, quote, heaven and earth. Now, the apostles knew this, didn't they? 
let me remind you again. In the Jewish society, they had four feast days commemorating the B.C. 586 destruction of Jerusalem. Did the apostles know that was called the Day of the Lord? Did they know it was called the Presence of the Lord? Did they know it was called the Coming of the Lord? Did they know that it was the time of the destruction of, quote, heaven and earth? Well, you know, to say they didn't is to say that they were truly some of the most confused and ignorant apostles and disciples of Torah poss possibly imaginable. But, you see, the commentators say, oh, well, you see, when Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, they thought about the end of time. Well, in order to make that assumption, Kenneth Gentry has to be able to prove, number one, that the Bible teaches an end of time, teaches such a thing as the end of the current Christian age, and he has to be able to prove, listen to me, has to be able to prove that while the apostles were ignorant of the fact that the B.C. 586 destruction was called the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, uh, the destruction of heaven and earth, that they nonetheless had a concept of the coming of the Lord to destroy heaven and earth at the so-called end of time, i.e. the end of the Christian age. So they didn't understand their own scriptures, their own history. They didn't even understand what their own feast days commemorated. I should say fast days. And by the way, this is found in Zechariah chapter 9. So the disciples were so confused and so ignorant as to not understand their own fast days and the language of the Old Testament prophets, but somehow, some way, they did understand, and that would have been from the Old Testament, by the way, that the Christian age will one day come to an end. And they imposed that concept onto Jesus' prediction of the destruction of the temple. Now, <clears throat> Again, make no mistake, Kenneth Gentry's eschatology is built upon the premise of the confusion of the apostles. And thus, like I said, I knew when I wrote this book, Watching for the Parousia, were Jesus' apostles confused. I knew without a shadow of a doubt. Now, mind you, I wasn't aiming it at Kenneth Gentry specifically, although I most assuredly interact with him a good bit because he had already written four articles on his blog trying to prove that the apostles were confused. So again, while Kenneth Gentry was not my chief, main, and exclusive target, he certainly was a handy target, and he is respected by an awful lot of people. So I most assuredly did interact with him <clears throat> in this book. So Kenneth Gentry says at the beginning of his article, uh, quote, One of my readers, who thought I was not busy enough, sent me a copy of Don Preston's book, Were the, Were the Disciples Confused? I, at least I think that is the title. The front cover of the book is itself very confusing in this regard. <coughs> The largest type font on the cover reads, Watching for the Parousia. The spine even has, Watching for the Parousia, where Jesus' apostles confused. It is not until you get to the title page that you find what perhaps is the official title, Were the Disciples Confused? Now, <clears throat> by the way, I've written so far four responses to Kenneth Gentry's first article. And you need to go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, and you can find those four articles. But, you know, here, here's, my, here's my real point. <clears throat> Is Kenneth Gentry honestly, seriously, trying to make a huge issue out of a distinction between were the apostles confused, were the disciples confused? Now, let me say this. 
where Jesus' apostles confused. It's on the cover. It's on the spine, it's on the back cover, and it's on the title page. Now, it is possible that Mr. Gentry has a very first run. Hey, maybe it's valuable. <laughs> a very first run uh, edition of the book. I did go back and make numerous corrections. No question about it. But the real issue is, why would Kenneth Gentry make such a huge issue out of the difference between disciples and confused? That's somewhat perplexing. Why spend so much time on that? Why make such an issue of that? But back to the main issue. I knew, I know, I was raised believing that a divided Olivet Discourse is the key to understanding New Testament eschatology. If the Olivet Discourse is not divided, <clears throat> that means Matthew 25, the coming of the Lord for the wedding, is A.D. 70. <clears throat> Pardon me. If the Olivet Discourse is not divided, that means that the Master going away into a far country, giving His servants talents, and then returning and judging them, was A.D. 70. If the Olivet Discourse is not divided, the parable of the sheep, and the goats and the judgment of Matthew 25, 31 to 46 is A.D. 70. <clears throat> if, if the Olivet Discourse is not divided, ladies and gentlemen, there is no futurist eschatology. And thus, when Kenneth Gentry realized that I had struck at the very foundation of his eschatology and of the very futurist eschatology of amillennialism and postmillennialism, <clears throat> well, as he said, uh, even though I was so horribly busy, he had to take time to say something about this book. And here's something absolutely amazing. <clears throat> Mr. Gentry says he's going to write four articles. I believe he's amended that now. But he said he was going to write four articles. Well, he's already, he's already published four articles. And here's what's amazing. Now, you would think that in addressing a book that strikes at the very foundation of his eschatology, that Mr. Gentry would spend his time addressing the theological arguments that I make in this book. Instead, he spends two of his four articles discussing what he calls my, uh, <clears throat> my attitudinal problems. And he makes some absolutely amazing comments. Now, <clears throat> I got to hurry here. On, in one of his paragraphs, Gentry tries to conflate the admitted surprise and shock of the apostles when Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple. And he said, Preston even admits their surprise. That's right. I've never denied that. That's not news. But then he goes, and he says, for in another book, he writes, uh, it's interesting to me, uh, Gentry claims that uh, he hasn't had time to interact with my book, but obviously he has my books. Interesting, is it not? Anyway, G then he continues, Jesus' response shocked the disciples. That's right, it did. That's a quote from my book. We shall meet him in the air, the wedding of the king of kings. And then Gentry continues, I noted that their surprise at his prophecy led to their confusion in their questions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Gentry is guilty of a fallacy here. He is equating their, confu their uh, surprise, their shock with their confusion. Where does that come from? <clears throat> And by the way, what's so shocking 
in Matthew 24, 2, about the destruction of the temple, when in Matthew 23, he had predicted the same identical thing. And it was a result of that prediction that they showed him the stones of the temple. And not only that, as I will share in future articles as well as future videos, Mr. Gentry <clears throat> knows without a shadow of a doubt. He documents it very, very well, as a matter of fact, that, the, that Jesus had predicted the destruction of the temple and the city many, many times prior to Matthew 24. Now, you want to be watching for that because uh, I, I'm going to be giving it to you <clears throat> directly, directly from Mr. Gentry's book, He Shall Have Dominion, A Postmillennial Eschatology. That's right, documented directly from here where Mr. Gentry says and documents from Matthew that Jesus had predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple many times before Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, Jesus is basically just putting the capstone on all of his previous predictions. Now, the apostles, <clears throat> yes, are they surprised? Yes. Are they confused? Well, evidently, if they're still confused about it, they didn't understand all of these previous, at least 15 previous predictions of the fall of Jerusalem and the temple. Boy, talk about some confused apostles. Well, I continue. Then, Mr. Gentry continues to make logical fallacies. He says, in the first two of my four, uh, four article presentation, I must express frustration with Preston's attitude. This attitudinal problem almost invariably annoys anyone who is not a hyperpreterist, and there are 7.2 billion of those people. In the third and fourth articles, I will highlight some problems I have with his actual argument. But he says, I have long realized that discussing eschatology with a hyperpreterist is like trying to saddle a wild moose. It's a whole lot of trouble and not worth it. Now, there's a logical fallacy here, <clears throat> and it's called the argumentum ad populum. Now, what does that mean? That's a Latin term. And it means an appeal to the masses. So Kenneth Gentry says, look, I disagree with Preston, and oh, by the way, there are 7.2 billion people who disagree with Preston. Therefore, Preston cannot be right. And yet it's interesting that is in, in his own writings, Mr. Gentry acknowledges the fact that what the majority of people believe proves nothing. Mr. Gentry argues in his own writings, and I document all of this in my articles on my website, Mr. Gentry acknowledges that what history has taught does not determine truth. So, why does he use that argument against Preston? Oh, well, because it sounds good. So, then he continues. Uh, and I want you to take note of something. Mr. Gentry talks about my attitudinal problems. And yet here is what Mr. Gentry sets forth in his very first article. According to Gentry, full preterists are cultic. That's right, we're cultic. I'll come back to that momentarily. According to Gentry, preterists are guilty of full-blown, a, a full-blown radically new theology. According to Gentry, preterists even have our own, quote, holy days, unquote. He refers to preterist pilgrim weekend as our holy 
days. Kind of sarcastic and snide, don't you think? Does that not reveal an attitudinal problem, maybe? According to Gentry, preterists are, quote, rabid and argumentative, unquote. According to Gentry, preterists are even like Nancy Pelosi. Now, if you want to talk about something insulting, <laughs> that's it. Uh, so here are the terms, for, words, and phrases that Gentry uses to describe full preterist. He claims that I have an ad attitudinal problem, and yet he uses every one of these pejorative adjectives to describe me and full preterist. And I want you to notice, he says, like Joseph Smith, the founder of the Latter-day Saints cult, hyper-preterists have created a whole new theology. Now, uh, you know, this, this accusation that hyper-preterism, the movement of covenant eschatology, is a cult, is really one of the most pejorative, slanderous, and false accusations that can be made. And what makes this even worse is that a man of Mr. Gentry's academic achievement absolutely, undeniably, unequivocally knows the accusation is false. If he doesn't, he's guilty of what I would call willful ignorance. Listen, there are certain characteristic marks, identifying uh, marks and characteristics of a cult. In my article at www.donkpreston.com, BibleProphecy.com, I list these and I go into detail. But number one, a characteristic mark of a cult is that, they, that it demands total and absolute conformity to the doctrine expressed by the cult, and the leader of the cult is, is the source of that doctrine. You know, like Jim Jones, like Mr. Jeffrey, the Mormon out of Utah of a few years back. Now, let's see here. Does Gentry and his denomination demand conformity to their doctrine? Well, you better believe it. Oh, for instance, if you happen to be a Reformed Presbyterian and you espouse covenant eschatology, guess what? You're gone. See? Oh, is that a mark of a cult, Mr. Gentry? Point number two, devout and unquestioning allegiance to the leader of the cult. No questions asked. No one is allowed to challenge the leader. <laughs> you know, anyone who knows anything whatsoever about the movement of preterism knows we don't have a pope of preterism. Now, we got a person or two that would like to be the pope of preterism, but it doesn't work, and they're not the pope of preterism. So, here in this second characteristic of a cult, Neither one of the first two characteristics have anything whatsoever to do with covenant eschatology. Point number three, the cult and the cult leader of a true cult controls the finances of the members. Well, you know, uh, Kenneth Gentry is glad to accept contributions, but he doesn't control the finances of those who follow his teaching. And by the way, I don't control the finances of those who espouse covenant eschatology. If I did, uh, I wouldn't have lost a significant amount of monthly support due to COVID. Th this, is, this is a slanderous, pejorative accusation. And once again, Kenneth Gentry knows the accusation is false. Point number four, the... the uh, the characteristic of a cult is the leader of the cult controls the marriages and the sexual relations of the members. Uh, look, folks, I mean, it, it, it's absolutely laughable. Absolutely laughable. If it weren't such a serious accusation that Kenneth Gentry is leveling at the preterist movement to say we're a cult, to say we are cultic, number one, Kenneth Gentry is either woefully ignorant of the characteristics of a cult, 
Or number two, he knows what the true characteristics are, and he knows that in spite of what those true characteristics are, he's going to pejoratively, slanderously label that charge against the preterist movement. And there's no excuse whatsoever for that. Listen, the only reason Mr. Gentry would make that accusation is to poison the minds of his readers. Oh, preterism, it's a cult, stay away, stay away, knowing full well that covenant eschatology is not a cult, it's not even close to a cult. Now listen, I'm out of time for this morning for our first video, but I want you to know uh, in, in response to Mr. Gentry's articles, and for your betterment of understanding, for the month of December 2020, for U.S. orders only, I'm making an absolutely fantastic special offer. My book, Watching for the Parousia, Where Jesus' Apostles Confused, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings, in which, by the way, I address so many of Kenneth Gentry's hermeneutical fallacies, his logical fallacies. I mean, I, I expose his incredibly weak arguments in support of his postmillennialism and his division of Matthew 24, and my book, In Flaming Fire, which, by the way, Kenneth Gentry applies to the so-called end of the Christian age. Now, if you purchased all three of these books by themselves, separately, they would cost you $60. For the month of December 2020, U.S. orders only, total, del <clears throat> pardon me, total delivered price, $40. Now, if you live out of state and you would like a PDF copy, or if, that is if you live out of the U.S., and you'd like a PDF copy at even greater reduced prices under certain conditions, okay, Contact me through my website, but go to donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. There's a wonderful banner produced by my fantastic webmaster, Alan Morton, right there at the top of the page. Just click on it, order these three books. You're going to find in these three books a 100% refutation of Kenneth Gentry's eschatology. And again, I don't focus just on him. I focus on lots and lots of other scholars, but I certainly expose Kenneth Gentry's eschatology. Okay, hey, I'm out of time. Thank you for joining me on this morning's Morning Musings and this first video in our response to Kenneth Gentry's attack, and really, that's all you can call it. It's an attack on my book, Watching for the Parousia, Were Jesus' Apostles Confused? I'll see you Monday.